Today's service introduces this month's worship theme, The Path of Resistance. And I want to begin with the trigger warning. The sermon that I'm going to share contains descriptions of physical violence, domestic violence, the violence of war. It also mentions death by suicide. Please, please, please care for your spirit and your emotions. Hatred is never appeased by hatred. Hatred is only appeased by empathy and understanding. This is an eternal law. So said the Buddha. Dear ones, how I wish we could cease our practice of war. How I wish that the world's preferred weapons of mass destruction, 20, 21, and 22-year-olds, would be ever forever spared the hell of battle, the nightmare of broken bodies, the horror of dying while crying out to a compassionless sky, or a life lived within the impact of trauma. Historian Will Durant has calculated that there have been only 29 years in recorded human history during which war was not underway somewhere. 29 years. The impact of war has grown with our capability to invent new methods and machines of warfare including today's morally contested drone strikes. Chris Hedges writes in his fascinating book, War is the Force that Gives Us Meaning. He says, in the wars between 1900 and 1999, not less than 62 million civilians have perished, nearly 20 more than the 43 million military personnel killed. In the last 100 years, an estimated 105 million people have died because of war, more than in any time in recorded history. I think it's safe to say that we, as a Unitarian Universalist people of faith, acknowledge the horrific nature of war. We may feel that war is necessary and support military action in certain cases, but almost none of us, as a matter of course, would choose war as the preferred option. Our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us not to be a warring people. Our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to be a peace-attempting people struggling with the specter of violence in our world. Now, I admit from the start that I am completely biased in this regard. I recoil from violence. It's my knee-jerk reaction. My gut response is violence in any form is bad. War is bad. Leaders and governments that send armies into battle are wrong. And yet, I know that I'm wrong in saying that. I know that I'm oversimplifying things, that with such a clear-cut statement, I am hiding from the complexities of life, hiding from the reality of creating safety in this world. I also know that my anti-violence, anti-war stance is a reaction caused by two things. My own personal experience with violence and my own wrong understanding of some key spiritual teachings. First, experience. Before we can discuss violence or war, we must be honest about what creates our gut responses. And so I ask with tenderness and care, 
what is your experience of violence? I recoil from violence because I have felt in a very, very small way the pain it can cause. I know that many here today have experienced violence in some form, including war. And I want to honor that experience. One of my earliest memories is from first grade. I remember running down the street towards home being chased by an older boy who was hitting me on the head with his metal lunchbox. I remember my mom standing in the driveway crying but refusing to stop the hitting because it was time for me to learn to stand up for myself. Was she right to stand by and watch me get hurt in order to make me tougher and stronger? Did I learn to stand up for myself that afternoon? What I learned was that metal lunch boxes hurt my head. <laughs> Those metal lunch boxes turned into metal lockers as I grew older. I was skinny, and I was what back then the other boys called a sissy, or as my mom would say, sensitive. Sensitive boys are ripe for slamming into lockers, for name-calling, and for fists. I was easy prey for the bigger boys. I guess I was supposed to learn how to defend myself and fight back, but I never did. Instead, I learned to be afraid of hallways and the guys who played on the high school football team. And now, now I am sensitive to anyone, be it a person, or a country that might use power to bully others, that might use force to force their views and their values on anyone. But the violence that most shaped me was the violence in my home. I know firsthand how a father's fist can hurt a body and crush a spirit. I know how anger can explode into physicality that seems impossible to escape. Thankfully, my family did our healing and found our way to peace. But I'm still really sensitive to anyone, be it a person or a country, who might use explosions of anger to dominate and control, who might use violence because they don't know how to talk, how to reason, to seek alternatives. And so, I admit, because of my experience, I recoil from violence. How does your experience inform your response to violence? The war. How could it be different from the person next to you? In terms of spirituality, I also recoil from violence. As I looked at the great wisdom traditions, especially the gentle teachers of Buddhism who inform much of my worldview, I heard the path of peace lifted up as the true way. I heard the teaching of ahimsa, or nonviolence, espoused by the great Buddhist teachers of India. I heard the Buddha teach that violence only plants seeds for more violence until 105 million people can be killed in just 100 years. But I was looking only at the surface of these teachings. Could my own experience be coloring what I heard and read about the Buddha and about peace? Now, I believe that these questions are especially relevant in relation to the war in Ukraine and our country's ongoing level of armament support. Some, first, 
just to ask, who here would identify themselves as a peacenik, anti-war, pro-peace? Just by who would wear that? Okay, great. But I do know that some of us are struggling because some of you have shared this with me. You're struggling, we're struggling, caught between our long-standing anti-war pro-peace sentiments and our desire to see Russia's aggression stopped and the Ukraine remain a sovereign nation. Buddhist scholar Andrew Olensky writes, a question that has been coming up a lot lately is this. According to the teaching of Buddha, and I think that's the next slide, according to the teachings of the Buddha, is violence ever justified? The short answer, he says, is no. But in a longer answer that probes more carefully some of the practical dimensions of the human condition, there may be grounds for modifying this position. The Buddha, you see, understood that we're all living out different roles in the world. We're all on different paths. Therefore, what is right for someone who has chosen, say, the path of a, a contemplative monk is a different role and path than one who is, let's say, an army general, a soldier, or the leader of a nation. Dr. Paul Fleshman writes, the Buddha did not teach social and political philosophy. He taught a path of life, not a blanket ideology. Guiding each in interested individual to walk the path the Buddha encouraged a pure mind that seeks the least harm. But he recognized different roles and obligations, different responsibilities and necessities incumbent on different individuals. The Buddha realized not all people are called or expected in this lifetime to live the life of an enlightened being, to expect the soldier or a king to act with the same heart-centered compassion as the monk is foolish, says the Buddha. Each has a different role and is at a different place in their journey of life. Did you know that in all the teachings of the Buddha, he never once told any of his pupils who were soldiers to put down their arms. He never told any of the kings who studied with him to cease their warring or condemn them for going into battle or fulfilling their governmental function. Dr. Paul R. Fleshman says, none of this, however, justifies hatred or violence in service of personal goals or gains. For the government employee who, for example, as a soldier must kill, the Buddha asks a question. Can you do this task as an upholder of safety and justice, focused on love for whom you protect rather than hate for those you must kill? A fervent champion of self-awareness and campaign compassion, the Buddha challenged them and us to look into our own hearts. He challenged them and us to ask, what is the motivation for our actions? What is the motivation for our actions? And then to ask again, am I sure of that? Knowing ourselves and knowing why we do something is his goal. So knowing ourselves and knowing our motivation is the Buddha's goal. So for example, let's turn back the clock 22 years to the time right after the September 11th terrorist attacks on America. Less than a month after the attacks, the US bombing of, Af of Afghanistan began followed by the insertion of U.S. Special Forces and then finally ground troops. 
Immediately after September 11th, a Buddhist perspective, and I would say a spiritual perspective, had to ask why we were attacking Afghanistan. Was the outrage in the country so overwhelming and galvanizing because 3,000 lives were lost in the attacks? And this was unacceptable. Was it because we could not risk any more deaths to terrorism? Was it because life is so precious that we could not allow any, any of our citizens to be at risk? Perhaps that's the case. But a spiritual person must look deeper and ask even bigger and more encompassing questions. A spiritual person must ask, as Dr. Paul R. Fleischman does, how do terrorists compare to other forces of destruction? Do the 3,000 deaths at the World Trade Center mean more than the 30,000 people who die in the United States every year by suicide? personal terrorism that gets little attention. What about the approximately 50,000 people who die in violent car attacks annually? What about violence against the environment that might eventually eliminate all human life entirely? We say we need to protect ourselves, and we do need to protect ourselves, so why have we also not declared a public war on death by suicide car accidents, and climate change, all possibly preventable and that have already claimed many more lives than terrorism. Why the energy around terrorism? Is it because it's convenient and popular? And why the inaction in other areas? Is it because that would be inconvenient and unpopular? Because it would cause us to talk about mental illness? Because it would cause us to talk about easy access to guns that are used in many suicides? Because it would cost us to talk about driving with distractedness or carelessness? Because it would cause us to talk about personal responsibility and our own impact on the environment? If we truly we want to protect ourselves and make the world a safer place, why not marshal our energy and resources for the other causes of death as well? The Buddha challenges us to search our hearts for the honest answers before we declare war on anything. Be aware, says the Buddha, know the motivation for action and know the motivation for choosing not to take action. And what about nonviolence versus pacifism? Did the Buddha believe that nonviolence and pacifism are the same things, that they are both always paths to peace? The answer, dear ones, is no. Nonviolence is different from pacifism. Pacifism is the belief that doing harm, that violence, war, and the taking of lives is always an unacceptable way of resolving disputes. It is a refusal to take up arms or participate in war under any circumstances. But could not pacifism sometimes allow a greater wrong to be perpetrated? Is restraint from action, from war, an act of peace or an act of violence if the resulting death from inaction is monumental? The world refused to stop Hitler early in his expansion, even though it was obvious what his obvious motives were in terms of world domination and the slaughter of Jews. Historians say that if the United States and Europe had acted early when Hitler's troops and territory were small and contained, World War II and that horrific slaughter could have been prevented. Will the same thing be said about us and the civil war in Syria? Over 310 million, I'm sorry, 310,000 killed and millions displaced. Will the same thing be said about us 
and Ukraine if certain right-wing or fascist politicians have their way. The Buddha did not teach war, but he did not teach pacifism either. He taught nonviolence, creating the least possible harm in a situation. Paul R. Fleshman notes, even Gandhi suggested there were times when not killing might actually be a form of implicit violence. He writes, did you imagine the Buddha as a yielder, as someone toadying to the unrepentant murderer? Did you imagine the Buddha building alliances with tyrants to keep the current calm, claiming unprincipled enabling as peacemaking? Buddha did not prescribe that humankind lie down before great wrongdoing or evil. He taught a lifetime path to shape a new humanity, starting with oneself and spread by inspirational example. From this perspective, it's clear that the Buddha imagined a world that would eventually become so self-aware and so aware of the preciousness of human life that no person would think to harm another. But the Buddha was not naive. He knew that day was far away and probably just a dream. But dream we must and work toward that day we must. Kea si sea, bendito sea. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen.